Well, welcome back, my friends, to the Mail Right Real Estate Agent Podcast Show. This is episode 106, and today our special guest is a returning guest from episode 91, way back in April. Uh, we have Miss, or I should say Mrs., since she's married now, <laughs> Rachel Ivanovich, who is an enrolled agent um, for t a tax advisor. Um, I can say that better. She's an enrolled agent tax advisor. How about that? And uh, one of our talks, top tax advisors here in uh, San Diego County, by the way, uh, she serves an international clientele uh, of small business owners and entrepreneurs and their families. She offers consulting, bookkeeping, uh, tax preparation, tax representation, and tax workshops. Woo, she's busy. Uh, Rachel, welcome back to the show. And uh, why don't you share with us, what is the difference between an enrolled tax advisor and a CPA as you introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back to the show. So an enrolled agent, we are actually licensed by the IRS. So we are the only tax advisors who have been given our authority to practice for the IRS and by the IRS, whereas a CPA is actually tested by the state. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your company too, just for those that may have been unfortunate and missed our April broadcast. Uh, where, where do you work and uh, what's the name of your company and all that good stuff? All right. Thank you, Thomas. My company is Easy Life Management. We're located up in Carlsbad. We have been um, in Carlsbad for the last 11 years and we serve local companies, uh, corporations, individuals, and their families. Nice. Well, and as I mentioned before, you visit us in April to give us uh, pre-April 15th tax advice. And because you are, in fact, m uh, my tax advisor, uh, we were talking yesterday, or actually this was last week, uh, and you had said a couple things that made me realize that we should get you back on here because you were asking me to consider doing things at this time of the year um, that I didn't realize was something that all business owners should be doing. So. One of the first things we discussed, and I want you to elaborate on, is uh, why do we revisit our budget uh, at this point in the year? All right, Thomas, I'll talk about that. So typically people get into the summer and start coasting through the summer, and people aren't really thinking about their taxes during July or August for that matter. But it's really important right now to start thinking about what budget did I set back in January for my business and my family? And where can I trim my expenses? Because it's the little things really, the compounding effect of, I'm just gonna have a Starbucks every day and that's $5. And or I haven't even really thought about my cell phone bill for a year or two or maybe three even or bank charges because oftentimes what I've found for my clients and for myself even, I'll just give you an example. So I went to AT&T, I, I use AT&T, and went there, my cell phone bill was out of control, about $300 a month. And I went in and reviewed the entire plan with ATT. They'd added additional items to my bill that I was unaware of. And I was able to cut my bill by $100. So that's something that's really important for you to think mid-year. Where am I spending money where, that, where I don't really need to spend that money? And if I've set some goals for my business in terms of, okay, this is what my advertising budget is, am I over budget? Am I under budget? And why? Because obviously at the beginning of the year, you, you set goals for yourself and for your business. And if you're not hitting those targets, then why did you set them in the first place? All right. So, so you're, what you're really asking us to do is at this point, be checking in to see if our budget is up to date and if we're on target or not. Uh, because if we're not, it's time to evaluate uh, why we are off track. Absolutely. Because we are halfway, more than halfway through the year. The second quarter right. just ended June 30th. Moving through the third quarter steadily, I can hardly believe that July is almost over. Our third quarter estimated payment is due in September. So a lot of business owners may not even know where their numbers are because they're not really even thinking about taxes until December, January. So it's really an important time of year to look at your numbers, see where you are, have I paid in enough to cover my taxes? Have I had a life-changing event? Have I gotten married? 
Have I moved? Have I bought a house? Have I sold a house? These are all important things. Have I refinanced my loan? Because if you have any of these events in your life, you really need to revisit either A, if you or your spouse have a, a job where you have withholding, or maybe you're a business owner who you have a company and you're paid a salary, you really need to look at your withholding here so that you don't have any surprises at the end of the year. And the other thing besides just tax withholding is also estimated payments. And without looking at your numbers mid year, you have no idea where you are in terms of have I paid in enough? Have I paid in too much? My opinion is we shouldn't give the government free loans. And so mm -hmm. I advise my clients and my family members pay in only as much as you have to. However, don't pay too little so that you're penalized. Right. Now, I mean, and I know like one of the strategies I use with you is sometimes um, I'm not going to file till October pr pretty much every year. I file an extension, but I make my payment back in uh, April so that the payment's on time. But because I'm estimating, um, I uh, maybe short pay by what, maybe a few hundred dollars to, you know, a minor thousand or two. So I'm going to take a small penalty in October, but pretty much by design. I, I, I know that's coming and I'm planning for it and I'm using that as say interest on the loan I'm taking by not paying up front. Cool. So, so, so there, the IRS and the French tax board, go ahead, you go first, Thomas. Well, no, that's where I was going. You just keep going. That's where I wanted to take you. Right. So the IRS and the franchise tax board, they have safe harbors for withholding and estimated payments. So it's very important to know your numbers and to work with your tax advisor to know exactly where you are with your numbers not only your profit from your business, but also if you have interest income, if you have dividend income, if you have capital gains, and so on. You really need to know your numbers because without knowing mid-year where you are, you don't know how much to pay in. So as you were talking about, Thomas, you filed an extension. So what I often have clients do who file extensions, I have them overpay with their extension in April mm -hmm. so that we can use whatever refund there is to apply to your first quarter estimate for the year that we're in. So for instance, right. let's just say, for example, this is true numbers, but I had you pay in, let's say $10,000. Right. And, but I, but I thought that you only were going to owe five. So that five would cover your 16. The other five would be your first quarter estimate for 17 when we actually file the taxes in October. And right. one of the reasons that we have clients extend returns is not necessarily because we need more time, it is to be able to have enough time to fully fund your retirement. And this is very important for some clients because they may not have all the money available to, to fully fund something called a SEP IRA, which you can fund all the way up until the due date of your return, including extensions. So that buys you that time to gather more money so that you can fully fund a SEP IRA, which is a simplified employer pension. So as a self-employed individual, this is a way to defer your income tax and put money away and pay yourself. So, I mean, it's not just for people that um, are procrastinators about doing their taxes like me, but it's, it's an actual strategy. Um, and it is. and the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, now you and I, we speak twice a year minimum in the sense that we're prepping for the payment I have to make in April and the actual filing I'm going to do in October. Um, but, Going back to what you were saying earlier, when there's a life event, like you, you sell a house, refi, there's a marriage or a divorce uh, or a birth, um, those are opportunities to reach out to your, your tax consultant and uh, update them at that point. I mean, you don't want people waiting to pile all this on April 15th, right? Absolutely. I would rather know before you buy or sell a home I would because then I can advise you and I can help clients adjust their withholding adjust their estimated payments because nobody wants to pay the government that's the bottom line however it's a requirement that we pay the government so if you reach out to me before you sell your home or before you refi then I can say oh wow you're refining your home you're going to be getting rid of your PMI on your loan 
and I can help you adjust your withholding in your estimates so that you're only paying in as much as you need to for the year. Okay. So um, that's a correction on even what I said. So before you do it, and, and I would agree with you because there's um, like, for example, I'm working with a client right now that's getting ready to sell one of uh, her investment properties. And the, and right. the first thing I asked her is, uh, are, you, are you trying to cash out or are you, are you going to buy another property? Because then we talk about 1031 exchange tax deferred purchases. Um, and the, but if they're going to cash out, you know, what I always advise my clients is call your tax preparer and let them know you're doing this. And um, I provide them with an estimated net sheet. And it's like, what is the tax consequence of this? Um, not that I'm trying to scare them out of selling because I want to sell their property, but I don't want my Absolutely. clients blindsided by because what they don't realize often is when you sell an investment property versus a principal property, it's a whole different level of taxation. Absolutely. Could you yes. talk about that a little? Like in general, yeah, what is absolutely. the diff? What's the difference between selling your principal property from a tax uh, event uh, versus a, uh, an investment property? Okay, I'll touch on that. So. What, what Thomas, you're talking about is what's called Section 121. So Section 121 of the tax code is a really great tax benefit for homeowners. When you own your home and you live in it for two out of five years, husband and wife, so if you're married, you can exclude up to $500,000 on, on gains when you sell the property. And this is not a one-time deal. You can do this every two years. Oh, so wow. this is a way that people are able to grow their wealth in that They'll buy maybe not their dream home, but maybe they'll buy something that they can afford the first time around. And then two years later, that home is appreciated $100,000, $150,000, maybe even $200,000. They can turn around and sell it after two years, exclude the entire gain, and take that money and buy another house. Maybe buy the dream house at that point. Maybe they buy the next step up house. And as long as that house is your primary residence and you live in it, you own it for two out of five years, you can exclude up to $250,000 per person. Okay, and now, that's a nationwide? If it's thing. an investment property. So let's say that's a nation, absolutely, that's nationwide. Okay. California conforms, which means that California does not tax you. It absolutely conforms to the section 121. So if you sell that house, it's not taxable in California if it was your primary residence up to $250,000 per spouse or per individual. So for instance, you live in the house and you share it with your significant other and you're not married. Each, if each of you live in it and own it, you can each exclude up to 250. So that would apply as well in that situation. Okay, so, so you don't have to be married, you just have to be on title. You have to, yes, you have to be the, you have to own it and you have to live in it. Right, okay. Okay, and I'm sorry, I cut you off. Okay. What, you were gonna explain the difference with an investment property. Okay. So let's say instead of selling that, that primary residence, you convert it into an investment property, or let's say you own an investment property and you rent it out and you decide after, I don't know, even a, a year and a day, because that would be considered a long-term gain on the sale of the property, that you're going to sell the property. If you sell the property, there will be two different situations that occur. So number one is there's a gain or a loss, depending on what the market's going. Mm -hmm. But there's also something called depreciation recapture. So when you rent out a property, you depreciate the property. So you take the, the, the value of the improvements, the building, you can't depreciate land, um, and you divide that up over 27 and a half years, and you take that portion as a write-off for every year. Now, if you oh. don't take that, the IRS makes you take it. So you definitely want to because the tax law states it's allowed or allowable is depreciation. So you, you probably definitely want to do that because otherwise right. when you sell the property, you have to add it back. And so I've had a couple of clients who've done their own tax returns. They've come to me after they've sold the property and they <laughs> did the tax return wrong and then I had to fix it and they said, oh, well, I didn't know that I had to take depreciation or they said, I, I didn't want to add it back so I didn't take depreciation. Well, guess what? The IRS things you for it anyway, so you might as well get the help go to a tax professional, have them prepare the return if you have an investment property. Yeah, I agree. And I, so the third thing that you were talking about, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, when you start getting into investment property, it's, I mean, to me, it's not a time to start to continue doing your own taxes or go to H&R Block. I mean, you, you definitely want a professional 
and, and I'm going <laughs> to throw my own family under the bus here because I watched my grandfather do it. And uh, when, when his estate was left to the family, it was a mess. And, um, and, it, and God love him. He, he did it to, he was, he grew, it was depression era. Uh, so he was very frugal. Um, and he did it uh, to bless our family with a larger estate. But the bottom line was there was such a mess to deal with. It would have been more worth him spending the money on a professional, uh, at least in the last 10 years of his life. Yeah, I, de I definitely agree with you. When, it get, when you get into more complicated tax matters, you definitely want to work with someone who's been doing it for a few years. And um, Investment properties in particular, I I personally think rentals are great um, in terms of growing your wealth. Um, there's a lot of tax benefits that go along with investment properties. There are a lot of write-offs. One of the little secrets um, that people may or may not know about, about not investment properties, but let's just say you decide to uh, rent out your primary residence during the summer for two weeks. If you rent out your home, for less than 15 days, you don't have to claim that rental income on your taxes. So okay. it might be a way just to have a little bit of a benefit during the summer. Like an Airbnb situation? Kind of like an Airbnb, but you, it has to be less than, than 15 days. Okay. So, but, but within that 15 days, you could have multiple tenants. You just have to start and end the process within 15 days. Correct. And it doesn't have to be consecutive. So let's say you do two days here and two days there. And as right. long as throughout the year that you're let, you're under that two week mark, you're totally fine. You can pocket okay. that money, go on a vacation yourself. It's just a little tiny loophole that some people don't know about. Um, but it's really nice to, to have. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, before I proceed with my questions, I want to jump over to Jonathan, who I also forgot to introduce. <laughs> Yeah, it's so hard. Jonathan, I don't, I don't exist still. <laughs> I was so excited to get into Rachel's uh, interview that I, I completely neglected to introduce ourselves. But I just assume we have so many fans now that everyone knows who we are. But just in case somebody's new to the show today, Jonathan, do you want to say hello and, and maybe ask Rachel a question? <laughs> Uh, I've got no questions. I'm going to leave that to you, Thomas. Uh, but I'd like to introduce myself, folks. I'm the founder of MailRite. We're a software marketing company that gets you quality leads through Facebook. Wonderful. And uh, just in case, uh, at this point, you still don't know who I am. I'm Thomas J. Nelson, residential realtor here in beautiful San Diego, California. And we're getting back to Rachel now. But I, I would actually say, Thomas, if you can, ask a question and then go for our first break after that question. Okay, so we'll do one more question and take a break. Um, so getting back to the investment properties, uh, if somebody is considering purchasing one, that's the time to come to you uh, as much as um, annually if they own one. Um, this is something that I learned from you. I used to include my rental property as part of my business, but you want that treated as a separate entity from my small business, my real estate business. Could you talk on that a little and the different schedules those show up yes. on? Absolutely. Yes. So the reason that needs to be separate from your business has to do with passive activity rules. So if you are a sole proprietor, you file a schedule C. So a sole proprietorship is a business that it's just, it's you, and you file your 1040, and you include what's called a Schedule C with that, and it's considered self-employment income, and the reason I don't want that rental income on your Schedule C is, number one, because I don't want you to pay self-employment tax on a passive activity, mm. so by statute, rent, rental real estate is considered passive, and I believe it was 1986, the IRS came up or Congress came up with the passive activity loss rules because people would generate these, these losses from passive activities and they'd use them to offset other income. So that's one thing to really think about. If your income is over $150,000 and you own rental properties, those whatever losses that you have, if you do have passive losses. So for instance, in Southern California, if you buy a real estate, a, an investment property, oftentimes it's going to have a pretty large mortgage on it. So let's just say, for instance, you're collecting $40,000 in rents per year, but your interest from the mortgage is 
$25,000. And then you've got another eight, 9,000 in property taxes, and then you've got management fees and so on. And then depreciation is probably another four to $8,000 in certain, certain circumstances, even more Then all of a sudden you've got losses on mm. paper for right. that investment property. If your income's under $150,000, you can use those losses to offset W-2 income, to offset and so on. However, if your income is over 150, the IRS, the jargon is don't lose them, but they go into a little bucket per investment property that you have until you sell the property or your income drops under $150,000. So back to that, that depreciation situation is, the depreciation is causing you to have losses potentially, and then you have to recapture or pay tax on it when you sell. But if you have passive activity losses, you can use those to offset the income when you sell. Okay. Um, and I'm going to um, get have into- I lost two gentlemen? Oh, I'm sorry. It, the, the signal went out just a little on my end, so I didn't hear that last part. I'm, I'm not sure where I lost you. However, what I was talking about was passive activity losses and how right. oftentimes with rental real estate, you will have losses on paper. And if your income's over a certain amount, 150,000, right. those losses are suspended. You can use those to offset the depreciation recapture or capital gain recapture when you sell the property. Okay. And we're going to um, take a break. Uh, so uh, Jonathan can... Uh, introduce our wonderful sponsor. But when we come back, I want to get into some corporation questions. Absolutely. Jonathan, I'll let you take it away. Oh, sorry there. Um, yes, <laughs> we're, we're going. Uh, I thought we, uh, sorry there, folks. We're just going to go <laughs> for our break and we'll be back in a second, folks. We're coming back, folks. Thomas is going to take over again where um, we're talking about the, all the field of saving you money. You've done your a load of donkey work, got <laughs> loads of new clients. You need to keep as much of that money as possible. Back to you, Thomas. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, before I actually um, ask the question, I wanted to ask, another question came to mind when you were mentioning that last um, piece of information, and that is, when I've been told by uh, a, a tax attorney that I took a class from years ago that it's a good idea to form an LLC around each rental property you purchase. W what's your position on that? Well, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> I understand. Uh, but you definitely need to consult with one. Um, Tax-wise, if you create multiple or series LLCs in the state of California, you will be paying there'll be a lot of costs associated with that. Okay. So that's not necessarily in my mind, the best way to go tax wise. However, you would definitely want to meet with your tax advisor and your t attorney and right. discuss your individual situation. Okay. And it sounds like just from your answer, that could vary from state to state. Uh, Absolutely varies from state okay. to state. California is, as we all know, a tax happy state, uh, yeah. but it's also beautiful here and people want to live here. Right. Well, and, and to be uh, uh, fair, that the attorney that was giving the class was from Utah, so he's uh, not necessarily familiar with California taxation and law. Um, but that being said, I, I'm assuming some of our listeners may be into S-Corps and C-Corps, so I wanted to talk about, um, first of all, when as a sole proprietor did you decide to go into a C-Corp or an S-Corp? How do you decide which one's right for you? And then let's talk about taxation within those. Absolutely. So it's a great question and it's a really good time of year to be thinking about this, mainly because I advise clients, if you're starting a business, you don't wanna jump right in and form an LLC or form a S corporation or a C corporation. You already have your hands full with your business and being a new business owner. So I advise clients, treat your business like a business. So open a business bank account, 
have a fictitious business name, get a tax ID number, treat the business like a business, but you, you don't necessarily need to start a business entity straight away. Strictly because the costs associated with opening a corporation, paying for payroll, paying in the state of California, you pay a minimum tax of $800 per year mm. um, to have a corporation in California, to have an LLC in California, same thing, $800 a year. So not only that, but you have a second tax return that you're paying for you if you have a corporation you want to have financial statements so you need to be hiring a bookkeeper so these are all of the things the costs associated with forming corporations forming llc's that oftentimes for a first-time business owner they're already overwhelmed with so many different responsibilities wearing so many different hats i just say okay make sure you have adequate business insurance to protect yourself maybe your house if you own a home is in a trust so that's protected definitely consult the attorney on that but tax wise before the, the tax savings really is going to start for let's just say an, an S corporation when you hit about $80,000 net. So my business, I was a sole proprietor for the first 10 years of my business strictly because tax wise, it didn't make any sense for me to have to form a business entity. So I filed a schedule C sole proprietor. I had errors and missions insurance, I had business liability insurance, business owner policy, made sure that that was all taken care of, had a business bank account, have a tax ID number. Um, but once you hit that $80,000 net figure, so net is your gross receipts less your expenses. So once you hit that 80,000, that's when tax wise, it's going to start making sense for you to have some sort of business entity. Okay. Now LLCs, a lot of people like them, but personally, I don't think that they save you money Tax-wise, as corporations, absolutely. As a small business owner, if it's you and your spouse, or if it's you and one other person, you can structure the business and you can structure the way that you get paid to save yourself money on taxes. So now, um, between an S corp and a C corp, what what's the strategy that each, uh, or the benefit, I should say, that each offer that makes one choose one over the other? Uh, is it the size of your business? Is it something you're doing, the type of business you're doing? I mean, how do people decide which corporation? Uh, and I understand you can only probably answer this from a tax point of view, but that's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah, that was going to be my first point is absolutely you want to consult with your business attorney, number one, right. um, and talk about your goals. You need to be clear about what your goals are. Is it tax savings? Is it li liability protection? Is mm. it to look more professional? I mean, what are your goals for your business? Um, C corporations are their own little isolated entity. So the C corp is completely separate from you. And the C corporation, there are definitely fringe benefits and other benefits that um, the shareholders enjoy. And that you definitely, if you have a lot of medical expenses, you can set up the corporation so that the corporation can deduct all of your medical expenses and so on. Huge fringe benefit. Oh, would, that make, would that make them tax deductible then? Yes. yes. So as a sole properly. I'm sorry, but as a sole proprietor, I can't deduct my medical bills, but as a C Corp, I can. It reduces your net profit. Yes. Okay. So you elaborate on this, the sole proprietorship. So as a sole proprietor, you're filing a schedule C and you're filing a form 1040, you may or may not be itemizing deductions. So if you are a sole proprietor, you can deduct medical expenses if you, they're high enough and if you itemize your deductions. So mm. it, as, as usual, tax law is very complicated. So I don't wanna say that you can't deduct them, you just can't deduct your medical expenses against your business profits. Oh, whereas, I see. Whereas a C corporation, if it's set up properly, you can deduct medical ex expenses and reduce that overall profit from your business. Okay. And then- So full proprietors, just, it, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, go ahead. Full proprietors, they can deduct medical expenses, but it's considered an adjustment to income. So it doesn't reduce your business profit, doesn't reduce your self-employment tax. It strictly reduces your taxable income. Okay, I see. Uh, and then with when somebody's uh, considering the S-Corp from a tax strategy, 
why are they choosing an S corp over a C corp? So a C corporation pays tax itself, whereas an S corporation is considered a flow through entity. So tax, it's kind of a hybrid sort of tax model in that the, the corporation itself doesn't pay the tax, but the income flows through to the shareholders. So the C corporation pays tax and then if there's any money left over, any profit, if the shareholders want to get paid from the C corporation, either A, they have to take a salary on form of a W-2 and they pay the FICA tax, Social Security, Medicare, federal, state, et cetera. If there's any profit left over after they take a salary, then they have to be pay themselves a dividend. And dividends from C corporations are not tax deductible to the C corp. So they're paying tax once on the corporate side, and then those dividends are also taxable income to the shareholder. Whereas S corporations, the S corporation itself does not pay tax. However, the profits from the S corp flow over to the shareholders return and you pay tax on the profits on your 1040 and you don't pay FICA tax on those profits. So you're saving 15.3% on whatever the profit is from that S corp. Gotcha. Okay. So the, thing, the thing that you really need to keep in mind with an S corp, which is this time of year, it's really important to check in with your numbers because the IRS requires S corp shareholders to pay themselves a reasonable salary. So then the question is, okay, well, what's a reasonable salary? Yeah. So if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, I don't know, whatever for your industry, maybe 60,000 is reasonable. You can take 40,000 and not pay the self-employment tax on that. Okay. So you're, you're looking at several thousand dollars with tax savings over a sole proprietorship, let's say. But so, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars, $10,000 is not a reasonable salary. Okay. So, that was going to be my question. Yeah. All right. But and, let's just say, sorry for interrupting, but let's just say that the first or second year, you're only making $20,000. 10,000 would be a reasonable salary if you're only netting 20. Okay. So, but the, the reasonable comes in uh, based on the type of industry you're in, what, yeah. what would be considered average? And your years of experience, your industry, the part of the country that you live in, and so on. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned this earlier, but I, I, I fear we kind of went through it quickly. I just want to revisit real quick. This is also the time of year where – if you haven't fully contributed to your SEP IRA, you would be doing that now. Or, um, But what if you don't have a SEP IRA? Is there still time to set one up and start paying into that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have, okay, so if you have a, an extension filed for your 2016 tax return, be it a corporate return or be it an um, individual 1040, you have until October 15th if you're an individual to set up a, a SEP IRA, it stands for Simplified Employer Pension. And if you are an S corporation, you can pay in 25% of whatever your wages are. So hopefully you paid yourself a reasonable salary so you can right. put it into your SEP. You also can do profit sharing if you have that set up and that you can pay as a corporation until September 15th. Individuals have until October 15th to fully fund. So let me ask you this then. So going back to your example uh, earlier where you said, uh, I, I, I write a check for 10000 but you feel that only five is really owed, so the other five will go towards my quarterlies. But mm -hmm. let's just say I didn't have 10000 to pay um, or I didn't want to pay. Um, I had it, but let's say I said, hey, Rachel, I don't really want to pay 5000 to the government or 10000 Can I open up a SEP? Yes and uh, s send it to the SEP, and that recalculates how much I owe? Absolutely, and that's a reason I, had, I do have clients who will extend it strictly because they want to have the time to save the money to fully fund their SEP IRA. And let's just say in April, it looks like they're gonna owe $5,000, but let's say they fully fund their SEP by October 15th, they end up getting a small refund in October. So that's, uh. it is definitely a, a good thing to do the planning in advance and to look at, okay, well, if I fund the SEP, my tax balance is going to be, I'm going to have a refund. And if I don't fund, I'm going to owe 5,000. So better to extend, save that money and pay yourself than pay the government. Okay. So then really to set up a SEP um, and really get the full advantage of it um, for, for last year's taxes, I would have done that prior to April before I wrote the checks. But if I wanted to set it up as an advantage for my 2017 
taxes. Now's the time to do it up until October 15th to still be able to pay into it. For 2017, you actually have until October of 2018. <laughs> to fund. Oh, okay. So you have quite a bit of time to do that. So it's, it's retroactive. So we're still funding our 2016. You're still paying yourself for 2016 all the way up until October 15th. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So 2016 ends this October. Correct. So okay. the extensions are due for corporations. They're due in September. So we've got about another, you know, two months before we have to get all those corporate filings in. Um, you can great time to think about, you know, fully funding your retirement plan, your profit sharing if you're on extension, and then October 15th for individuals. But what you do need to keep in mind is that traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs have to be funded by April 15th for, to, for it to be counted as a prior year contribution. Okay. Uh, whereas if you have a simplified employer pension or a SEP or profit sharing, you have until the extension due dates, which is September and October. All right. All right. Yeah. So uh, what about, now in my industry, in real estate, uh, we're often told to have uh, an emergency fund or, or to have reserves. And um, I want to know from your point of view, without telling you what the traditional uh, you know, rule of thumb is, what, what do you recommend to your clients? Like, what do you, I know it might be industry specific because it, um, of how they get paid, but like for your realtor clients, since we have a real estate audience, uh, what is your advice to them as far as how many months reserves and, and how many, is there a difference between your business reserves and your personal reserves? That's a great question. And it's hard to be self-employed. It's very hard because you wake up every day and you're unemployed unless you go out there and get the business. So what I tell right. clients, number one is if your taxes aren't current, get your taxes current. Make All sure right. Make sure you've paid your estimated payments. Right. Before you do that, I mean, you, you absolutely have to stay in sequence with your finances. And before establishing that emergency fund, I would say make sure that your tax filings are current. Make sure you've paid your estimated payments because that's the last thing you want is the government hovering over, um, breathing down your neck, wanting you to pay them. Once that's current, then... I recommend clients to at least ha save one month business expenses, if not three. If you can have three months business expenses in reserves, especially if you pay your payroll, then that would be a great place to, to be. Personally, if you can save six months, great. But honestly, when you live in Southern California, how many people have six months of yeah. their, their personal expenses in savings? I hope... I, our entire audience does, but if you can have three months for your business in reserve and then six months for your personal, that, that would be what I would recommend. And is, is it that you get your business up to three months before you worry about your personal or do you kind of jump back and forth and build them as you go? Um, I would build both as you go so that you have a personal reserve, but also a business reserve. Okay. Um, I, I start building my business reserve first because I do have five employees and I want to make sure that I'm always covering their salaries because their families are depending on me. Right. So if you have employees, if you have contractors that you're paying, definitely you want to keep that business running. Okay. So, but what I would do then under this plan is I would get a month of business reserve and then I would build a month of personal reserve and then jump back to get my second month of business and so forth. Exactly. And make sure your tax savings, either you're putting money aside for taxes Right. Okay. So, because and you, you advised me of that a while back. And I think our rule of thumb was uh, I have a 25% account. So anything I bring in, I take 25% of that, that gross and stick it in a separate account so that when you say, Hey, I need 15 ,000. grand yeah, <laughs> or something. Yeah. It's not a shocker. I, I got, right. you know, I can say, Oh, I got that, you know? Uh, yeah, because I think that's one of the biggest shockers for people, new, newly self-employed individuals is that how much you have to pay into the government. Yeah. When you're an employee, your employer is paying half of your taxes for you, the social security and Medicare. And that's a big, that's a big chunk. So definitely putting at least 20, 25% of your gross away because you're going to have expenses but you definitely want to have enough money in the tax savings at the end of the quarter to be able to make your tax payments. And we touched on this back in April, but I think it's important to touch on it again because, uh, and I'll be the first to admit, I've made this mistake in the past where 
um, you, you, you know, especially in real estate, cause you get these lump sum checks and all of a sudden your memory goes blank that you have taxes and, you know, and you, I go, woohoo, I can pay off the visa card. Right. So I, I pay off a, you know, a $5,000 visa bill and I think, hey, yeah, I'm debt free. But then the tax bill comes and I'm like, oh, oh I didn't have that. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, uh, advice you gave me a long time ago was make sure, again, that you, you have covered your tax obligation before you go paying off a debt or creating more debt. Right. I think that that's a huge, that's a huge stumbling block for self-employed individuals when they get, let's say, a, a windfall. All of a sudden, let's say you close a big deal and you have $20,000. What do you do with that money? Make sure you're putting money into the tax savings straight away. Um, yeah. Look at, do I have any savings? Because who knows when the next deal is coming? Hopefully you have a lot of deals in your pipeline, but you definitely, and that's, you know, to circle back to the budget, that's why you have a budget is so that you are budgeting and taxes should be part of the budget. Savings should be part of the budget because if they're not later, you're going to get yourself in trouble. If you have, you know, a month, two months where there's no income all of a sudden. So yeah. you have to treat the business like a business and really have a business, a working business budget and a working personal budget. Well, and that is the discipline that's tough, but it, I mean, I know, you know, and it's funny to me that it took really meeting a, a, a tax professional like you to make it all come together for me um, as a free spirit in charge of a budget. But, you know, I finally realized that the budget is really just a series of buckets that you have to fill before you get to go spend money on the fun stuff. And, and that's the discipline is, is recognizing that some of these buckets are only half full. And that's the, you know, like you said, the tax bucket, the, you know, utilities bucket, the savings, but, and also the reserves bucket, um, you know, things like that, that are important uh, for the rainy days uh, before you go out on that $10,000 vacation. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and, and you, well, and you go have ahead, to sorry. have the sunny day bucket. I was going to say you have to have the sunny day planned too, the sunny day bucket, because you do, you can't just work and not spend in money on fun things as well. So some people call a budget a spending plan and it's easier mm -hmm. for them to swallow is that I can spend money on my Starbucks or I can spend money on a vacation, but you do have to look at overall and look, be global about it and say, okay, well in six months I have to buy this software or in, um, eight months, I have to pay, you know, twelve hundred dollars to my E and O insurance, or my, I've got this dental emergency that I might have, you know, around Christmas time or around the holidays. That all of a sudden I'm gonna need a thousand dollars for a crown, and if I don't have that money in savings, then I'm gonna be in trouble. Whereas if I put, you know, fifty dollars a month into a medical bucket, and no, I'm gonna have that money just in case I need it down the road. Yep. Then you can go out and have your Starbucks or go out and have a small vacation and not feel bad about it. Well, it's the same advice I give my investors because we look at a property and one of the things we assess is part of the budget being the maintenance fund. And, uh, and there's a percentage rule of thumb that we use based on the age of the property. If it's 10 years or newer, it's a little less than if it's 10 years or older. Um, and, and it depends on if it's a condo or a house, but, um, you know, and they said, well, why do I need to sock away this money that's taken away from my profits? And I'm like, the first time you have to put a new roof on that place, you'll understand why you have it. Because when you've got a 10 to $15,000 event on the average home here, um, it, and the money's put away for it, it's, it's a far easier to, 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 to swallow than uh, if all of a sudden you have to cancel your vacation to pay for the roof. Right, exactly. It's better to plan in advance. And I have clients, I myself have five different bank accounts and that sounds like a lot, but at the same time, if I can divide my money so that I know this money is allocated for taxes, this money is allocated for my emergency fund, this money, I've got my business bank account. I've got my business savings account and then I've got my fun account. So I'm funding all of my different bank accounts so that I know that the money is divided up for specific purposes. Then I can feel good about spending money on a vacation or a weekend away when I'm, when I want, because that money's already been allocated to that. And I've allocated money to my tax savings 
and I know it's there when, when it's time to pay my taxes. And then you can breathe easy. Better to plan in advance. You know, and if you reverse engineer it, starting with paying your taxes back to your business plan, your marketing plan, your vacation fund, you can see how it all ties together. And, you know, those days you wake up and you don't feel like going to work. All you got to do is look at your budget and that'll motivate you <laughs> as if it's behind schedule, Absolutely. you know, so I could see how this all ties together yeah. and, and um, involving uh, your, whoever does your taxes um, at, in, as part of this plan uh, is a huge strategy that has done a lot of a lot of good for me in the last few years working with you. So I just encourage people to think of your tax advisor more than once a year around April 15th. Uh, Rachel, Absolutely. I want to thank you very much for joining us on the show. And before I, uh, so I know we're, we got to wrap things up, Jonathan, was there anything that you wanted to touch on that we haven't already? Not really. I think you covered most areas. Um, it's an area that a, a lot of people tend to put in the back of their mind but with a bit of planning and some good advice you can save yourself a load of money and grief can't you thomas yep absolutely and uh, i always like this tip so i want you to share it again rachel is your oil change tip <laughs> okay absolutely i always advise clients to go get an oil change on New Year's Eve or January 1, that will mark the beginning and ending mileage for the year. So you can always track your business miles and definitely keep your mileage logs, everyone. Yeah, that's that pesky little thing that <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's such a challenge because when you jump in the car, it's the last thing you want to deal with. But um, it, it certainly is something you want to deal with when, you, when it comes time to make the deduction. So it's easier yeah, to do that. But the good news, folks, Absolutely. is that it's one area where technology really helps because there's some really fantastic apps out there for your iPhone and Android that really helps enormously with all this, isn't there, Thomas? Absolutely. Yep. There's a few that I know a lot of my realtor friends use uh, an app, and I don't know how it works, but every time you get in the car, it knows you're in there. And, and you can even tell it if you're of the mind, uh, whether it's a business or a personal trip. So it tracks it and separates it for you. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to belabor that, but I wanted to uh, thank you once again, Rachel, for joining us because, um, I, you know, it was funny. It, it was just the conversation we were having last week that led me to realize that we needed to share some of this information with everyone because you were sharing it with me. And I realized that I didn't really think about the fact that uh, mid-year is a good time to start strategizing with your tax advisor. Um, so thank you for coming back on and sharing this additional information with us and our audience. You're welcome. And uh, uh, we'll have you on again, I'm sure, we'll come tax time next year. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to share with everyone how to get a hold of you in case they have any questions or want to become a client of yours. You can contact me. Uh, my website has my phone number, my email address. It's elmtax.com, E-L-M like the tree. Thank you so much for having me again on the show, Thomas Nup, and Jonathan. Absolutely. And Jonathan, you want to let everyone know how to get a hold of you? Yeah, it's really simple, folks. You can email me at jonathan at mail-right.com. You can go on the Mail Right Facebook page, or you could go to the Twitter account, which is mail underscore right. That's at mail underscore right. And you can get a hold of me in all those places. And of course, I'm Thomas J. Nelson, residential realtor here in beautiful San Diego, California, where I'm never too busy for your referrals or to assist you and network with you. Uh, you can find me on thomasjnelsonrealtor.com, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And until next week, folks, we want to thank you for joining us on our show. Whether you listen to us on iTunes or watch us on YouTube, we appreciate you listening, downloading, streaming, and of course, we always Love to read your comments, so please leave them, and uh, including any suggestions for future show guests. Until next week, have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>